You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 51. This is your host, Chris Sims. Today on the show, I've got special guests, Michael Ashley and Tom Noble, and we'll talk about photogrammetry. Let's get to it. Okay, welcome to the show. Today I've got Michael Ashley. Michael, how's it going? It's going great, except for all the rain. Yeah. And uh, so Michael's a regular guest on the show. I guess by now you're you're more or less our, our co-host rotating in and out. Um, and you might know him from the previous episode of Archaeotech that aired two weeks ago about Codify. And joining us on the show today is Tom Noble. Tom, how's it going? It's going great, uh, except for the rain. <laughs> Just visiting for a short time, and it's rained most every day. Nice. It's uh, it's almost like you're up here in uh, Portland or the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but today we're going to talk about photogrammetry. And uh, Tom, could you give us a, a brief introduction on you know where you're at and and what you're up to? Well, I am now retired for a couple of years from the Bureau of Land Management, um, but while working for the BLM probably the last at least 20 years almost, I worked uh, using photogrammetry for uh, a variety of things. Uh, we, can become, we, we began doing photogrammetry on uh, very small objects or very large scale subjects, uh, dinosaur track sites, archeological sites, um, and continue to develop techniques over the last 15 years to make that, um, you know, very highly accurate, and very portable, and very convenient for users. We think that's excellent. And uh, Chris Webster, who is our normal co-host, he unfortunately could not join the show today. Uh, he's got a whole lot of other stuff going on. Um, he he showed me the. Uh, one of the tools that you developed for photogrammetry, the, the long rod. And, uh, so you've, you've developed a lot of stuff for that. So I think before we get really into the weeds on photogrammetry, uh, we've had an episode or two in the, in the past since, uh, Chris Webster and I rebooted the show a couple of years ago on photogrammetry, but I think it's important to kind of recap and just briefly introduce, photogrammetry for anybody who's not familiar with it. So it's it's way more than just taking pictures of things in the field. Uh, Tom, I think you would probably be the best one to kind of give us a, a brief intro on that. Well, you know, photogrammetry goes back uh, a long time. I guess technically the concepts even predate photographs. But with... Uh, Aerial imagery, especially in the late stages of World War One and then World War Two, photos were taken with very sophisticated, uh, large format aerial cameras, and could capture a lot of detail on the ground. And by large format, I mean the negative of the film was you know, nine inches square, approximately. And they had what would be looked like a long lens, but the, the interesting thing about photogrammetry and why it's more than just taking pictures is there is geometry required in taking those photos. And even with large format aerial cameras, that equivalent focal length of that lens is uh, in the 20 millimeter range in a 35 millimeter uh, equivalents. So it's a relatively wide angle lens. And that is important because with a wide angle lens, the camera can move quite a long distance between captures of a subject and capture a stereo model of those areas of overlapping photos uh, with good geometry. The geometry is formed by the positions of the cameras. So we continued with that concept that is very important to be able to extract three-dimensional information with good geometry images to the close range format. So we could take photos with a relatively wide angle lens and a 35 millimeter film camera originally, but now digital, 
move the camera, capture the subject with overlapping images, and extract very high-quality three-dimensional information. And the platform used to be aerial, but really doesn't matter as long as the images are of high quality and overlap and are uh, and form that geometry. So we began taking pictures, you know, from the ground, from long monopods, looking down in a native direction or horizontally towards uh, petroglyphs on a vertical wall. It just doesn't matter what the platform is. You have to establish that geometry and have high quality images. Is that a good enough? Um, brief yeah, history? yeah. That that's a uh, that is a great starting point for that. So I, I guess where to go now is uh, let's hear some of the ways that you have used photogrammetry in in your work. Well, photogrammetry was utilized by the BLM primarily for um, resource management purposes. Um, we had well. The Bureau of Land Management uh, manages several hundred million acres of land, and there are cases where just monitoring and assessing the health of the land, but also oftentimes there was uh, mineral extraction and sometimes trespass situations where we could utilize photogrammetry to uh, assess how much, say, gravel was extracted from a gravel pit that was not necessarily uh, uh, appropriate. It was in trespass on BLM land, and so we could then assess how much volume-wise was, was taken so that we could uh, utilize that information to, to go get more uh, royalties for the mineral extraction. So primarily that was what uh, the BLM use was. But in addition to uh, health of the land and, and trespass, we on the, the public lands have a tremendous number of paleontological and archaeological sites. And it uh, it's always something that people strive to do is capture and document those sites as well as they can. We could capture and document those sites being paleontological or archaeological to, um, you know, incredible accuracies, um, you know, in the millimeters uh, with relative ease by just taking the photos and taking them properly. So uh, we have taken the cameras to, you know, many parts of Wyoming and Utah for, again, petroglyph sites and dinosaur track sites or a lot of paleontological sites over the years so that is really interesting and michael you've also worked a lot with photography and photogrammetry uh that was correct me if i'm wrong here that was that was what your dissertation your your dissertation involved that heavily as one of the methods right well um, actually no um in, in the sense that it, it i wish that it did but um <laughs> Uh, my actually initial dissertation um, was going to be on photography and archaeology. Uh, and then I kind of drifted into studying vision specifically. And then from there, I looked at how archaeologists see in the field. Um, and however, dur during my entire dissertation time, I was working principally at Chatalhuyuk in Turkey. And, uh, you know, I had Tom, Tom and his wife, Joyce, over for dinner last night. We didn't get a chance to, to mention this, so it would be a good, a good time for a story. Because basically one of the things we figured out was we had, we had a tent and in this tent we had, um, covering the, the shelter, basically covering the, the excavation area on the top of the mound. Uh, we got some big wall climbing gear and we basically would hoist ourselves up every time they had a burial or other important feature to document. And we were able to do, you know, aerial photography. Now we didn't know the principles of photogrammetry very well at that time. So this is like the, you know, early 2000s, but we introduced a digiplan method, um, which we would then, you know, take a series of images and try to get as high as we could and, and as, and as uh, you know, use the longest part of the lens we possibly could do. Um, introduced DSLRs only by, I think, 2003. Before that, we were using little Coolpix because that's all we could afford at Coolpix. 
it was like eleven hundred dollars then. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, right. You know, and started at like six forty by four eighty the first year and went up from there. But anyway, my 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 point is, what we were able to demonstrate with this digital plan method was was the, just the you know it was a there's a lot of tension about you know it, you know the we got to we have to draw we have to draw everything some of the, some when we're dealing with really complex burials in a very arid condition um some of those could, could you know desiccate and and become you know really fragile or basically effectively ruin ruined uh within a couple of hours so the idea of being able to pull them fast was really important um and document them thoroughly and then what what digital planning allowed was the ability to um to really kind of focus on the important things that, that you need to do as a human observer of that situation and, and then leave the details to the lab. However, it would have been really fantastic. And we had our first experience seeing like structure from motion photogrammetry in 2004. Um, and uh, at that point we were able to actually really understand the power of this method. And it wouldn't be until 2011 when I was working with Tom where, you know, where you really understand that just taking a couple of images and as, as Tom said, as he always says, and taking them well, so I mean, they're in focus and they have proper overlap. Um, and then you're able to get geometry. So this is the part that I think is really hard for people to grasp because it just seems like magic. Yeah. But we're talking about taking pictures using a camera in order to generate geometric data as well as having color data, and photographic information that unto itself is already valuable. If we had had that technique then, um, honestly, we would have been able to do absolutely amazing things in terms of looking at these overlays of burials, as Tom said, to the to millimeter accurate, and, and probably wouldn't have even needed to go aerial because we could have just done these from the ground uh, with the pole. So the world has changed. Um, it's become really easy to do this technique. I, I really feel it, it's ethically almost immoral to not do it if you're out there because it's just too easy to do um, with a little bit of training, which I'm sure we'll get into all those depths next. Nice. So then uh, I'm really curious uh, to hear about uh, the work that uh, you've done with Tom. Uh, you said uh, you guys started working together in 2011. Uh, what were you What were you doing together? Well, we actually started working together a lot sooner than that, but our kind of big project um, – was a perfect confluence of awesome. We had the Presidio San Francisco, San Francisco um, have has the Officers Club, which is effectively in con contention for the oldest building in the city, and they were doing a massive re uh, massive uh, restoration uh, project, and so the adobe walls were exposed um, and and left open for a while. So it was a fantastic opportunity. I knew that I was in way over my, my head to do this documentation. And so I asked uh, Eric Blind, who's um, now the, the chief archaeologist there, if you know if we could bring out Tom and try to do this um, this documentation the right way. Um, and it was an amazing experience in, in terms of we, you know, we rented top level gear, I rented top level lighting uh, equipment. And now, of course, uh, you know, Tom will tell you, I mean, he was just there yesterday at the Presidio it's all buttoned up and you can't see those walls anymore. So it really was when it's a, a, a true, like once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and so now we could go back to those images and, and, and reprocess them at, you know, hundreds, hundreds X speed, get better data out of them. And that's all really great. But the, the, the really fascinating story happened after Tom left because the West wall, which was exposed external, um, external West wall, had a gabled um, um, adobe all the way up to the gable, which is very rare in the world, but certainly rare in California. And over the weekend, so they exposed it, they removed the scaffolding over on a Friday. And I had just, I wasn't even documenting that day. I was i was doing a different documentation. I just took a bunch of happy snaps. I wasn't even really doing a great job. Tom would have been very angry with me, but it wasn't, that wasn't my <laughs> intended target. But on that weekend, I got a phone call. They said the wall has slumped and had moved like a significant amount, like like a, an eighth, uh, sorry, a half an inch. And they're like, what are we gonna do? And they had emergency meetings and they thought we would have, that they would have to actually take apart the wall, um, a portion of the top right corner, uh, which would have been really a tragedy. So I processed the images, they were able to produce these very large kind of ledger size um, images in CAD 
um, drawing over them and using that documentation, they were able to, to ascertain the engineers were able to effectively save the wall. I think that's amazing. I mean, even doing crappy photography and crappy photogrammetry can still render saving cultural heritage. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Tom, you want to add? Well, it, it's always interesting. You know, photogrammetry is one of the, maybe the only technology that you can go back in time. So if you have any images of a subject taken properly, hopefully, uh, and you take a repeat capture, and again, even uh, happy snaps, just shots of, yes, the camera does in fact have to move, but you can put your comparison, you can put these images and projects back into 3D space and get differences and actually tell how things moved, even though you may not have intentionally uh, you know, been planning on things moving, but you have before and after or during photos and only photos that can allow you to detect change. And it's, uh, it is a, a remarkable thing in, in my mind that you can, you know, literally go back in time and find some historical sometimes images and determine how much things have altered or changed uh, with, with again, nothing more than, uh, some photos and some some scale, some way of providing scale to to the project, and that's what we have done a lot of. Now the you know the the Presidio was was a wonderful and challenging subject, and thankfully uh, you know Michael is an experienced photographer, and you know, the, like I said, the hardest part of doing any of this is to get good images, and when someone knows how to do that using uh, camera and light equipment that makes things uh, much nicer. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the fact that Michael was able to, you know, understand and be able to just take some additional photos of the wall, like you said, just on a Friday afternoon, you know, speaks to the simplicity of a very complex process uh, that can be done by just about anyone. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of questions about about that, but I think this is a good point to take our first commercial break and we will be right back. Let's face it, the quality of archaeological field photography could really use some improvement. We aim to change this with the Codify Magic Photo Board. This lightweight but incredibly durable board is designed to help you take color-perfect photos of artifacts, features, and sites using almost any camera, even your smartphone. You need to see it to believe it. Engineered from exceptional quality, color-safe, high-pressure laminate, Codify Magic Photo Board is ready for tough field conditions. It's guaranteed to level up your photography. Start taking publication-worthy photos right in the field with the Codify Magic Photo Board. Available now for pre-order, visit codify.com slash APN. That's codifi.com forward slash APN today and get your promo code exclusively for listeners of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Okay, and we're back. And so, Tom, before we went to break, you had said something really interesting about the simplicity of very complex tasks, and that really highlights uh, just the the technological capacity that goes into photogrammetry, but um, also just the simplicity of the task itself of 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 taking these photos. So, I'm I'm sure it's a lot harder than it sounds. You know, like I, I've been on several projects. And I've never been on a project that actually has used photogrammetry, but I've been basically every single project I've been on has used photography. So there's definitely a difference between just taking photos and and doing photogrammetry because you have to have measurable space. So what are some of the the technological requirements for taking a good photo of your subject, and then also making sure that it's it's measurable and usable in a photogrammetric sense. Well, it it is not, um, I guess, simple in some respects. But uh, once you grasp the requirements, it is no more difficult than really taking photos. There are some requirements to what makes a good photo. Um, in order to get the highest quality measurements from a set of images taken for photogrammetry, 
the camera should be fixed focus. In other words, no autofocus. All images should be captured with consistent lens settings. The, the ability to calibrate and remove lens distortion is critical to a, a, a highly measurable or a successful photogrammetry project, which makes it different than just taking snapshots. Uh -huh. In order for the software to generate, derive, and accurately uh, calibrate a lens and camera system is all of the photos for a set, for a few photos, should all be taken without any change in focus. So it's not quite as easy to take really good photos when you're doing <laughs> photography because you have to try to maintain your distance because you can't just push the autofocus button and, and bring your subject into focus from a different point of view. You have to capture the subject without changing the lens and camera system. And it's preferable to keep the aperture at the same setting as well because that change in aperture will change the light diffraction to the lens, which will also potentially impact the camera calibration. So we insist that the photos are taken high quality in focus, uh, good contrast, but you know, you put handcuffs on people a little bit, say, well, you can't actually refocus and you can't change your aperture, but I still expect high quality images to be taken. <laughs> yeah. In understanding how you move the camera to capture the appropriate overlap and form good geometry um, is not technically difficult, but it seems to be confusing to people without some training and without a little bit of practice. But ultimately, it's really not difficult in understanding the fundamental concepts and actually doing it and learning and doing through practice uh, how to capture uh, good photogrammetry photos is not that difficult. Um, it, it does the more experience you have with anything, the easier it gets and the faster you can accomplish uh, good work. But but ultimately, it's no more difficult than understanding your camera and taking pictures. Nice. So what would you say uh, for someone just starting out, uh, trying to get into it, what would you say the minimum requirements for a camera would be? So uh, it needs to be a camera that can have a, a fixed focal length and, and a fixed uh, aperture um, what kind of megapixel requirement are we talking about for a DSLR? Well, you, really, the megapixel is not terribly a driving factor. Um, you are taking photos preferably with a relatively wide-angle lens, therefore, to capture uh, you know, higher resolution images with a low megapixel camera, you may have to get closer to the subject. Ah. But ultimately, it's more about the quality of the lens uh, and the ability to fix those settings on the camera. You know, uh, point and shoots often you cannot set them to manual. Uh, phones, you can't set them to manual. It's going to focus. It's going to change those things. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't capture images and turn it into a 3D model, but you may not be able to measure to the level that is possible if you do have fixed images. So having a DSLR with a high quality prime lens with a lot of megapixels, well, sure, that's the best, but you can do a lot of good work with a manual, um, a point and shoot that has the ability to set it manual. Um, we've done a lot of good work in the past with a Ricoh GR that has uh, an infinity focus setting and uh, a fast shutter speed capability. Yeah, I use, um, I, I always talk about this camera. I still love it. I have a the Sony NEX6. Um, you can get them on eBay for, right now, I just checked less than $200 um, in mint condition. And 12 megapixels, shoots camera raw, has a fantastic app that, I mean, well, I mean let me rephrase that. Fantastic sounds like a president. <laughs> uh, it has an app. <laughs> That sucks, but works. Um, that that you made by Sony that allows you to have remote shutter. Um, I've used it on a kite 
uh, with, at about 250 feet without any form of wireless capability, just having the Wi-Fi. I was pretty blown away that it worked at that distance. Wow. Um, so it, it's great. It's a, it, and I love them. Um, and you, and the other thing about that, the Sony that's great is it has a you that it has interchangeable lenses. I I do use I do leave the zoom lens. It's actually really great, but I leave, I leave it as Tom says in a fixed position. But ideally, I would replace out that lens with a with a with a fixed lens. And there's several um, wide angle options. You can spend a lot of money now on a mirrorless camera. The Sony's um, a friend of mine, uh, um, Andy Roddick. Great photographer and archaeologist got their new mirrorless. It's just, I think it's a, it's close to two grand, yeah. um, and it's astounding. It's absolutely amazing. So there's there's a lot of options out there for sure. There are a lot of options. The interesting thing that with you know interchangeable lenses on digital cameras and or autofocus and maybe even auto zoom is there's motors on these cameras and lenses, and that's a good thing and a bad thing in that a lot of the lenses will have essentially slip rings. In other words, they're not physically connected to the lens uh, system. Uh, and, and the reason that's a problem is they used to be physically geared. And so you could tape a lens into place yep. and, and more or less guarantee that things weren't going to move. Well, they are not necessarily connected internally, and so even uh, taping that focus ring in place will not guarantee that the internal lens elements aren't going to move. And again, when you put a camera on a kite or on a pole or you just walk around with it and you think it's fixed, it may not be. And so it can alter the internal uh, lens and e either become out of focus or change the lens enough to affect adversely the camera calibration. So there are some requirements or some, some things to look at in the kind of lens and how well it can be fixed in addition to the, to the quality or the build of the camera. I mean, a couple of things I wanted to make sure we cover for sure today. One, um, Tom and I have only kind of tangentially talked about this topic, which is the the, the hot button topic, which is around uh, drones or UAVs. So I want to make sure we get into that. <laughs> uh, but the other is, I, you know, this thing that may sound a bit preachy that we're saying is actually really important. And that is you were seeing, I mean, all of a sudden photogrammetry is all the rage. I mean, at the SAAs, I got exactly two questions. Hey, something, something about Codify <laughs> and, and questions about photogrammetry. Um, and our photogrammetry uh, seminar that we do through the Center for Digital Archaeology, now run by Adam Prince, um, is always is by far the most popular class that's going. Um, and there's, but but what we're seeing is a bunch of pretty 3D models now in you know on on Sketchfab and other uh, things in PowerPoint presentations at 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 um, sessions. And if you, if I just go well, let's just take a look at the actual data, the 3D data. It's 99% of the time just not that great, and that's because it's just now it becomes so easy to produce a 3D model. It's okay. We're not saying that's bad. If you just if you if your intent is to fly people through stuff and be able to look at things, that's great. But if you actually want to be able to measure, okay, the model, put it into an orthophoto and measure it, that's what we're talking about here. And I mean, I, as as as. Uh, as guilty of this as anybody. I mean, I mean, I, when I was first starting out, I was, I thought I was doing everything right. I had the fixed lens. I had it all taped. I did that. And then when you produce an ortho photo where it's trying to put everything to the same planar level and you're looking at whole areas of this, of the model, I'd be asking Tom, why is all this stuff blurry? Yeah. You know? And Tom would go, he would just go nice and patiently go, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not. It looks terrible. And you realize because I'm asking the, the model to do too much because I didn't plan for my intention, which was to produce, you know, if I have three feet of depth on a wall and I'm three feet away from it with a wide angle lens, good luck solving that. I mean, you know, you know, it's, you know, if I'm just shooting plate in you know, straight planar shots, it's just not going to work. I mean, we're, it, it's physics. Um, so it's those kinds of lessons that I feel like are, are you know, like the next level. Um, and you can almost like learn how to do this stuff the right way accidentally if you just actually actually practice in the real world which is what 
Tom's workshop's all about. Yeah, that's a good example because like last summer in Belize, I uh, I was shooting. I had a uh, a staff member on who she was not an archaeologist. She was she was a photojournalist, and so she had amazing technical ability. Uh, you know, to take like journalist quality photos. Um, but it was a challenge to get the like scientific quality photos out of out of all of this, despite you know her having stellar equipment in the field. Uh, and so it was one of those things where you know I did not have a background in photogrammetry, and so we ended up getting the result that we wanted. But then in you know later on after I had come back from the field and started to get involved with uh, the Center for Digital Archaeology's workshops and all that and started really getting into the the weeds on the photogrammetry workshop that that you just mentioned Adam Prince runs I realized I had made so many mistakes and it was so frustrating for me to look at that and go ugh I could have had so much more so you know looking forward I think photogrammetry and you had really pointed out photogrammetry is going to be important but it's going to be important to do it correctly not just to produce a pretty 3D model, but to produce something that's measurable and like scientifically valuable. So uh, let's go into, uh, you had mentioned the, the Tom's workshops. Let's talk about that real quick so that our listeners can get some info on Tom's workshops. Well, I, I said, I am retired from the BLM. I was asked even before I retired to, if I would please continue to provide some training at some level. And so I have gone to locations and put on some training sessions um, at oftentimes back with either the BLM or the Bureau of Reclamation or the USGS. Um, and also we have an ongoing um, hard to describe relationship that is a National Park Service uh, funded uh, workshop in Nantucket through the University of Florida. And there are other conferences and or things that people ask about a training session. You know, over the years, having done photogrammetry, we've provided training as short as, you know, an afternoon or a day. Um, but we often and prefer to have several days uh, to provide all the background and all the understanding that is necessary to really uh, you know, make fewer mistakes in the field and actually understand how to capture good high quality photogrammetry. I was told it's interesting, you know, having a one or a two day workshop people have come back later and said, well, that's like giving people a loaded shotgun because now they know just enough to, to do a lot of things wrong quicker. So <laughs> having a good understanding, uh, you know, can, can reap huge benefits, you know, in the field situation. I think your, your field experience probably tells you that you could have done things differently, but not had cost you much more time or effort to do those things. Right. And having that understanding of, about how to do it right up front is, is the key. And Definitely. if we get people trained some understanding about how to take the pictures right that can lead to very high quality scientific measurable data with almost no additional cost, that's that's my goal. I'd just love to have more people have that understanding. It's become, as Michael said, it's so easy now to slap a camera on a drone and go take pictures and you can get some really stunning looking models how well that can translate into uh, you know mensuration and potential change detection down the road is is suspect nice yeah this is the this is the real key like um you know when we're looking at 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 uavs and drones and all these things um it's it's still it it, it doesn't change the equation i feel like in some ways we're back to looking at cool pixels and and our ability to get a result um, and then look at it years later and it's like, my God, look at all the pixels that, because I can see them because they're huge. Um, or chromatic aberration, which is a fancy word for weird color. Um, so, you know, um, I, there's issues around this, this thing called rolling shutter. A lot of the drone cameras are actually just video cameras that actually will pull, pull frames. 
Um, there's issues about the the geometry, the precision of the GPS in it. The GPS in the in the I mean we have um, so Codify we bought for for dev work. You know the Inspire Pro. It's awesome. It's got the Zenmuse camera on it. It shoots camera raw. Um, it still has issues with rolling shutter that have been they're finally being corrected in software. Um, and we are getting some pretty outstanding results. So I guess I want to preface something before I have Tom load a shotgun and start talking about and dismantling this. But <laughs> I, I look at it like this. I want us to imagine the following scenario, which is exactly the scenario we're actually trying to make happen. So you're going to go do a phase one survey. And you have, um, and I'll, I'll give the example of this uh, project we're doing with, with uh, Dig Tech in Nevada. So you have, we, it's an open road. There's plenty of space. It's on BLM land. There's no issues with, with, uh, you know, with flying, it's plenty of clear, clearance and, um, and, and the sky is clear as a, as a bell. And you're going to go do a resurvey. You're going to intentionally go and, and walk on this landscape and, um, and you go and pull in your Google map data <laughs> because that's all you got. Uh, for aerial imaging um, that you want to so you and load it into PDF maps um, and be able to plot some. And it's just absolutely useless. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, so imagine being able to pull out a drone, fly um, a mile of that or two or three or four, which you could do in a, in a couple of, of jumps, process that data in the field for the intention of building um, imagery for the intention of walking a survey. See, that then then we've done that and it's absolutely amazing. It's fantastic, it's useful. You can see artifacts on the ground, you can you know, it's it's transformative for the purpose of survey. Is it a 3D model? Is the purpose of that, you know, to do DEMs and do kind of micro contour analysis of that road? No. <laughs> but <laughs> if I want to do that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom say so Tom, I have two 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 desires. We go we're out, we're doing the survey, we find some really interesting things, we see some things on the ground or in that first level imagery that actually look like features, let's say, for example, that you wouldn't be able to see from the ground. What would we need to do with that kind of gear, with a, a reasonable drone and a reasonable camera to get actual data that's useful? Yeah, it's, And you got two and a half minutes to answer. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> There, there's just a whole lot of things that can go wrong with the drone. Uh, and often the payload that they can carry is not adequate to carry a, a high enough quality camera that avoids rolling shutter and has uh, the capabilities that are necessary for photogrammetry. But very often you can either get that camera locked down, fly slow to either minimize or eliminate motion blur and rolling shutter effects, there's a lot of things that you can do even with poor equipment to get the best results you can. Or sometimes the drone is not the appropriate platform. You may be better off getting a monopod that's up in the air as high as you can get it comfortably and capture from something other than drone with a higher quality camera. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is that if you are, if, if what you have is a camera on a drone that's not really a photogrammetry quality camera well in order to get highly mensurable you know maps that you would be able to do 3d modeling and, and contours on well then you're going to have to have a lot of ground control you're going to have to have targets on the ground that you have known positions of and that will help you then um, control the error <laughs> that you're going to have in that capture if you don't have a high quality camera, you're gonna have to have control. It's so what what will control. constitute a high a a good a good enough camera for this purpose? Well, again, uh, the the Muse camera that is fixable in far as uh, consistent focus, it does have a global shutter, or it takes all of the pixels at once. Uh, and it has a reasonable wide angle lens, uh, you know, in the 30 millimeter or, or wider angle to a 20 type millimeter lens, you can capture high quality photogrammetry data with a drone. But I'm so throwing a GoPro on, 
right? Yeah, that the new GoPros have essentially a fixed focus because they can't focus, but they're inherently going to have a rolling shutter. And yes, I've seen, and you can see the software does corrections for rolling shutter, and I can guarantee you that correction is not good enough yep. to get a 3D surface from. It just, microns matter when it starts doing the camera calibration, and uh, the rolling shutter is going to introduce enough error most of the time to adversely affect a 3D model. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, as Michael said, you can generate actually a very high quality 2D orthophoto from really crappy imagery, surprisingly <laughs> enough, and do a, a pre-survey uh, map, essentially, uh, using the photos. But trying to do some change detection detection or 3D modeling or contouring of that terrain is suspect unless you control the camera. Yeah, so what we did in just, I know we're just about out of time but in, in this section, but just to kind of bring it full circle, two, two interesting survey um, experiments. One was what I just described, and I'm telling you, I mean, I can't even imagine doing pedestrian survey without this tool if I have the tool available to me. Um, it's really transformative. And the second was uh, rock art panels that were that are inaccessible and being able to see individual petroglyphs. And the result of that, you know, we able, what we were able to do in a 15 minute fly over was the entire APE of an, of an area, um, that'd be the entire area of, of our project interest. And uh, it is mind altering, it's fantastic. When you look at the data, the 3D data underneath it was, it was just, it wasn't good enough. Um, for for that purpose, but if you are going, all right, well, here are a bunch of petroglyphs that I want to go out and study. Then we, all we need to do is go back. We have the overall topography done. Go in very selectively and just, you know, as as Tom said, fly really slowly. <laughs> um, you know, take shoot camera raw. Um, do all the right things, and and uh, and the results are absolutely amazing. And that that's why you know I, I agree with DJI when they call it a flying camera. It is a camera with with propellers, but it's moving. It's this the whole camera. If you guys look up rolling shutter, we're dealing with like it's like just smeary. I like the word smeary. It's like it's smeary. It's just it's just <laughs> that each each image is kind of smeared into the next at the pixel and subpixel level in many cases, and it's and that's that's the problem. I mean, it's like it's gonna do it's gonna match it up. It's gonna look like something. But when you you look at it and it look like you know a bunch of wax candles that have melted, you know where you're expecting edges to be edges, and you look at the underlying 3D model, and it just looks like what is up. <laughs> so that that's what we're kind of just it, it's it's fit for purpose basically. Yeah, yeah. And you you can look at really uh, rolling shutter kinds of of video, and it is stunning. But it may not translate. It does not translate well into a uh, measurable uh, images that can that can be used in photogrammetry very well. Definitely, I I love playing around with my GoPro for just you know beautiful footage and and beautiful photos. But there's so much barrel distortion on that wide angle that I would never try to take a profile or plan view. Uh, photo of a site with that thing but uh we'll go ahead and take our our final commercial break and we will be right back this is christopher sims host of the go dig a hole podcast it's a show geared for early career archaeologists where I bring interviews and casual panel discussions about the challenges and opportunities that many archaeologists encounter starting off. So, if you're still in school, thinking about going back, just getting started, or want to take the next step, you'll find what you need to go dig a hole. Tune in every other week on the Archaeology Podcast Network. Okay, and we're back from the break. And so for most of the show, we've been talking about the cameras, the equipment, and the techniques, and the methods of, of doing photogrammetry. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that um, 
that I'm really curious about to, I think our listeners will be curious about is the processing. So we have mentioned software and this is such a deep thing to go into that, you know, like we had mentioned, Tom, you had, you had said to, to just cover this in a couple minutes would be like letting someone run off with a loaded shotgun. So, you know, definitely before you listen to this podcast and try and go off and, and do this on your own, take a webinar, take one of Tom's workshops. Um, you know, this is just kind of what we can cram into an hour and it doesn't even do it justice because it's, you know, its own field of science. But um, so let's talk about the options and the next steps. Yeah. Well, first of all, to now. say, um, honestly, I mean, look, you know, uh, the, the webinar that Adam Prince is doing, uh, which is the, as we called it, um, archaeology, photography and photogrammetry for archaeology. It's just amazing. It's great. It's totally worth it. And the, the, the format that the Center for Digital Archaeology is doing is um, a little bit different than a lot of webinars. It's, it's capped at a maximum threshold of about 18 people. Um, you, it's a two hour session. He goes over things with plenty of space for questions. And then uh, and typically people are bringing their questions and their models and their ideas and their mm-hmm. scenarios and all these things to the to the party. Uh, so that's a great resource. And it's and it's. Um, honestly is super cheap it's a great way to start um there are a real at this moment i say I, I feel a real lack of um options for what we would call immersive training trainings i mean you know we got tom here you know it's he's my gandalf and i, I can't and that you know it, it's so the <laughs> idea of like trying to figure out how to make uh you know th- these trainings um more readily available is is on our short list of things Meanwhile, there's Culture Heritage Imaging offers a, uh, if you happen to be in the San Francisco area, um, you can check out their training. That's an option too. Um, and, uh, but for archaeological stuff that we're specifically trying to address, um, there are other, other things to look at on, on the web. But I guess I'd say, please reach out to us. The more We're at a point now, as we're reaching out and working with societies and, um, and companies, and there's so much interest that you letting us know that that interest is there will help us make it all happen. Um, I'll, I'll also mention um, in, in, so that Tom will have two things to talk about. In terms of processing, you know, the most important thing right now from my perspective, if I can be the you know, archeologist thinking about rescue archeology, span think about, or, think about the Orville Dam. Think about situations in, in, in Syria or areas where we're dealing with rescue archeology span situations um, I was just talking to um, uh, Fabio um, Esteban yesterday, where he's down doing a, a program down in Uruguay, um, condition assessment. There's a million different possible uses for having just getting the photos and figuring out and dealing with the processing later. So this is another kind of major, major thing. I mean, I'm don't, definitely going back to um, the images of the, of the Presidio and reprocessing them um, now years later. But I have on my screen um, something I, w- I wanted to show Tom. And we'll, we'll if we get the permission from the, from the tribe, the uh, Federated Indians of Great Rancheria, um, at least we'll get a screen cap on, on the, the show notes. But this is a boat um, in, that was, that's uh, located in Marin County. And this boat caught on fire recently and, and, and burned. Um, and they had taken a bunch of photos from, from all sorts of different angles. Um, they're all blown out on one side. There was no intention really at this time, I think, that to really, you know, they captured it from a variety of different sides. I just threw them in here and processed it with absolutely no settings. And we have a 3D model of it. And I'm going to be meeting with them tomorrow after I, get, after I pick Tom's brain about some things we can do to improve it. But that's the thing that's so amazing about this, you know, is, 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 is that if you have them, um, of any level, you can get some results, which is pretty pretty incredible. Um, if you produce images that are in focus, that are um, properly exposed, um, and have these additional parameters, then you really have something amazing, which is kind of great. Um, in this case, our objective, the dream would be, if the boat is gone, wouldn't it be great to have an ability to have it at least virtually reconstructed um, and kept back and kept in memory? That's kind of the, yeah, the money shot for me. Yeah, no. absolutely. And one of the things that really amazes me about 
photogrammetry as far as I've I've learned on the just the most introductory level is the the enormous range of scale that it can be applied to so you know I at first I was thinking about artifacts and just taking a a photogrammetric uh you know useful 3D image of artifacts and you know then as I learned more I realized you can do it of an entire site which is just mind altering and so like I had I had seen the the drone flyby of of the old mill in northern California that you had done Michael and uh you know that was just amazing and so you know it's really got my gears turning about you know how can I get you know an entire Maya site into a photogrammetry <laughs> program now so you know it's just incredible yeah the same camera same lens same everything can be used for you know something as small as a coffee cup up to you know something that's you know 300 meters large uh again same camera same lens now each subject presents different challenges to get the pictures correct you know small objects and up close are a challenge for any photographer to maintain focus and get good crisp depth of field photos uh so the 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 scale is not the issue it's always an issue of capturing good photos and you know there's a qualification on good without changing focus in, in a lot of other camera settings for photogrammetry purposes but yes it is astonishing you know how flexible you know photogrammetry is uh, it, you know you do have to have some way of lighting the subject generally but other than that um, it's not it's not the problem take having a camera and you get a photo you can get a 3d model you know the processing is sometimes there's so many pieces of software out there that it's a it's a moving target in some respects and there's a lack of understanding about how far the processing has to be pushed to get uh, mensurable results yeah, they, they all of the software packages have different approaches or different levels to to how well they calibrate the lens and again that's where you know my experience doing photogrammetry tells me that that's a fundamental requirement to get high quality measurable information so i know the levels that i feel are required to process those images in a project to get the level of accuracy or understand the level of accuracy uh, with whatever software you have you know over the years i've used a wide variety of software the current one you know shameless plug is for photo scan uh, because it's a reasonably priced capable uh, software package but there are others out there it's just that i know that they do it right as far as the camera calibration goes yeah, a couple of things on that. So, uh, first of all, exactly the other the photo scan uh, when we you know first got it back in 2011, I think it was like 0.2 or something uh, beta, <laughs> and uh, and they've been amazing. Um, they come out with updates practically every week, it seems. Um, so the other thing that's key is they really listen to the community. You know, at the time we were making a decision. So just think about that. That's just not that's just not that long ago. Um, so they were making a decision. They made a decision um, to to release an educational version of the full version of the software for five hundred forty nine dollars, where other photogrammetry packages, which were a lot harder to use, were still in the thousands of dollars with like a ten percent discount. Wow! And it flooded the market. And you can get started with their standard version and do a lot of great stuff. Um, for I don't know, I think it's like fifty nine bucks educational. Yeah, educational. So. So the but the but honestly, as important or whatever whiz bang and great as PhotoScan is, the the really key thing is the is the community around it. Very very active community. Um, lots of people can learn the skill set and the specific workflows of of PhotoScan, and and then learn from each other. And uh, you can go again. It's simple. Like I'm just trying to get started to re ask, asking crazy questions about how you can use. You know, Amazon Elastic Computing to build a, a basically a rendering farm and everything in between. Another option is Pix4D. Uh, Pix4D's um, kind of niche is aerial UAVs. They specifically have profiles designed to handle things from the um, 
Phantom 3 on up. Um, I haven't personally used it, uh, but one of the things that they have that's interesting is they have a rental model. So, you know, and it, their, their full package of software, I believe, is around $9,000, but you can rent it by the month um, or even by the hour. And they also have educational programs as well. Then there are open source open source options, and um, there. It, it, I hope Tom can talk a little bit about that. But the bottom line is that with the open source software, um, there's just typically a bit more learning curve um, in terms of getting everything set up. It's the usual thing; you kind of get what you pay for. Um, but do you have um, experiences there? Well, yes, and you do get what you pay for, and you know you can spend no money, but you have to have some computer knowledge to make it all work usually. The other issue for a lot of software, Pix4D included and, and others, it's a lot more black boxy. In other words, you don't have control over uh, how well you can tweak the results. And uh, you know, I've used five or six different packages, starting with PhotoMonitor in the beginning with a very expensive uh, Atom technology uh, software package and then PhotoScan and the reason I've used the ones that I or settled on the ones that I used at a certain period of time was that I had control over how well I could process and how well I could optimize and how well I could generate a camera calibration. And I didn't have to just trust the black box settings. <laughs> uh, so that that was important to me to be able to quantify, you know, my results. Um, the 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 open source is is usable and it does work, but in all of those software packages work. The key thing that you need to understand is if you take those photos correctly, all of those software packages will work. The, if you capture good, high quality with geometry overlapping stereo photos, it doesn't matter what software you use, they will work. You will get a model from them. So understanding how to take the pictures and, and, and high quality photos that will give you measurable results is in fact the key, no matter what your software choice is. Yeah, I mean, this point just does, you know, it's been beaten into me, drummed into me for now for a long, long time. And it is just actually true. It's amazing. Like if you just take the pictures and, and have that done um, and then Beg, borrow, seal a license. You can process. You can process these things, which is great. Um, which may be, be, be basically leads back to the, the initial point of. Therefore, there's really kind of no excuse to not do it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, you know, we've mentioned this before, but the the project in in in, in Israel, um, the Legio project, the Jezreel Valley projects. At this point, you know, we're looking at uh, total photography time of five to seven minutes for a four four by four or five by five meter area um able to get you know accuracy down to the you know sub centimeter uh, level or better and produce ortho photos and that entire process is less than half an hour um and then they're back and back to work working on the next um square down or next low size low side and that's like that's it that's tr beyond transformative and and um so we'll make sure to put in the show notes some of those models that people can take a look at. But it, it's a, it's actually just completely amazing, yeah. <laughs> um, as a as a as a new capacity. And I'm I'm even more excited um, on profiles. I feel yes. like profiles in archaeology are, first of all, if you photograph properly, you can cut a profile for the purposes of geometry anywhere in the model you want, any arbitrary angle you want, which is totally cool. But when we have a clean profile, if we add in, we have to make sure, I know we have, we have, we have a couple of minutes left, um, but I want to make sure that we also point out that color is, if we had color and geometry, now we have the, the affordances of both of those. So yeah. you know, we're building a, a new photo scale that has, um, will also help you to balance your color. And wouldn't it be amazing if you just were able to have a, a beautiful, you know, profile section from your trench and, and have it be color calibrated as well as a geometric model out of that. 
How badass is that? Absolutely. And I feel like it would just be negligent at this point to uh, leave out the Codify photo board because this ties right into uh, white balance and, and color management and photogrammetry because the Magic Photo Board has photogrammetric markers on there. So, uh, you know, any longtime listeners of this show or of the APN is, have probably heard the, the little ad that we put into some of the shows. But, you know, like we had some demos at the SAA and this thing is really amazing. And it talking about the scale of photogrammetry at its current incarnation, it can handle fairly large artifacts um, not massive artifacts, but fairly large artifacts, and do all of that. It can manage the the color, the white balance, the and also it has the markers on it so that you can have measurable photos to then dump into PhotoScan or any of the other programs and get a quality 3D scan of an artifact. Yeah, and so our plan now, is, is moving forward in the next months, so certainly by the summer, is to come up with a set of new scales that are uh, specifically designed for photogrammetry. So more on that later. So working out the details, but they are in, in the works. Um, we're also really excited to point out that that one of the fundamental cool things about the board is that it's 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 waterproof. I mean, we starting in January when we um, were sh shipping them at the SHA, um, underwater projects are using these as well, which is super cool. I mean, Tom reiterated last night over dinner that you can do this stuff underwater. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, I mean, that's what's so amazing. It truly just feels like, you know, uh, almost a, 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 a miracle tech um, that's accessible to all of us. My whole point this year as our side, not even a hobby, a real kind of core mission is to level up photography for archaeology. And these are the ways we can do it. You know, it's um, in lab, out of lab, in field large scale, small scale, you know, adding in the color, being able to get that additional capacity. I just feel like it's really, it would then we're not even talking about it being a, just a geometric model or a pretty photo. We're really talking about it being a, a multi-dimensional data set. We haven't even got in into multi-spec, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or, or other, or UV or IR or, or, you know, um, LIDAR and other types of capacities that are also there, Tom. Yeah. And all of those things are possible with, you know, just what equipment most people are going to the field with today. I mean, that's what's remarkable. It used to take specialized expensive equipment both in the field and in the office and that's not the case you're going to take pictures anyway if you have some training and understanding about how to take those pictures and make those pictures become real scientific data it's it's incredibly valuable and again it's almost negligent not to do it uh, because you're going to be taking photos anyway for almost no additional expense in time or equipment, you can make scientific data capture from those photos. Absolutely. Well, I think that's about all the time we've got today, unfortunately, but you know, it's all about control and consistency. There's going to be links to all of the things that we've discussed in the show notes. You can find those at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeotech. This is going to be forward slash 51 for episode 51. And, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing this conversation with Michael and Tom. And guys, thank you so much for joining the show today. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. That's it for another episode of the Archaeotech Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeotech. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for this episode. You can also email us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag archaeotech or tag at archpodnet in your tweet. Please share the link to this show wherever you saw it. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. 
Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www dot archaeology podcast network dot com contact us at chris at archaeology podcast network dot com Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just seven ninety nine US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.